Hey guys, it's Timothy here, um, coming at you from the classroom. We have a teacher work day today, which means I get to uh, kind of relax and go over these magic cards without any stress, right? No students coming back. But uh, anyway, um, I thought I would go ahead and catch us all up to speed on any of the spoilers that had come out since the Masterpiece series was um, released a couple days ago. And also um, go ahead and go through the uh, rare dual cycle, um, or rule, rare dual land cycle that we're going to see in Amonkhet. So, uh, pretty exciting, actually. I, I think they're fantastic. But anyway, uh, I think I missed this card at some point. Um, it was spoiled, like, in the midst of all of the masterpieces being spoiled. But uh, I, it is a card I wanted to mention because it is quite good, and I like to mention every card. But um, this one is it's a zombie jackal, another one. I think we saw one already, but that was a Planeswalker-specific a uh, Planeswalker deck specific card. This one, I believe the name is a uh, Miasma Mummy or something along those lines. Or maybe Miasmatic or something like that. You, you can tell from the name, right? Uh, one in a black for a 2-2. Zombie Jackal uh, at common. When it enters the battlefield, I believe it's each opponent discards a card. Um, it may be target opponent, but I'm pretty sure it's each opponent. But that's just a good card for limited, right? I mean, it's a natural 2-for-1. It's not very often your two mana creatures have a two for one built in at common, right? A lot of times there'll be cantrips or something like that. And admittedly, making your opponent discard a card is not as good as you drawing a card, but this is just a solid card all the way around. Um, it's not clear, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not clear right now in Amonkhet Limited whether or not uh, two twos will be like premier creatures. Um, that That's something that changes very drastically from set to set, even within a block. Uh, in Triple Kaladesh, your two drops were crucial, like you had to have two drops in order to keep pace with the board, be able to crew your vehicles, be able to block on time, and just not die to aggro. But when Aether Revolt came out, like you can get away with playing very few two drops in your deck now. Um, so I don't know, maybe they'll be relevant or not, but this is just a good card. Uh, it's going to be annoying to play against, but it's going to feel very good when you play it, especially if you're on the uh, draw, it basically mitigates... Or I'm sorry, if you're on the play, it takes away your opponent's advantage of having an extra card. And it's not like you're paying a premium for that. This could easily be like a three-mana creature with the same effect. But two mana to make your opponent pitch a card and get a 2-2 two -two is sweet. Uh, probably more than... <laughs> I, I don't really talk about commons for very long, but I, I want to emphasize that this is a good, solid card. Like... Uh, definitely above filler material, and the fact that it's a common is pretty nice. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and skip through the masterpieces. If you want to hear about those, go check out my other video on them. Um, we've got all the basics. I don't really like to spend a lot of time looking at basics. I think they are sweet. Um, I love them. I, this island is, like, super vibrant and everything. But I'm no, like, anesthesiologist or aesthetic. I don't know. Anesthesiologist is not the worst. Um... Yeah, I'm, I was trying to be fancy with my uh, vocabulary there. I, I'm no like artist. I don't want to critique other people's arts. And uh, honestly, I think if somebody's going to go through the trouble to make basics, like it is worth looking at them. I think they're beautiful. But uh, there's not a lot to talk about there. Keep in mind, though, that one in every four booster packs is um, going to have a, one of the full art lands with the little bolus horns on it. So you'll be seeing a little bit less of these, but nonetheless, you will be seeing them. And uh, these are just one of each. I think there's three of each basically and they're all wonderful um but anyway the cards we came here to talk about we have a like the most um generic of the generic cards you can think of right when they make new mechanics like this embalm mechanic what they like to do is um they, they make just like at least one or two very simple basic cards that showcase the ability and this is kind of what we have here like about as vanilla as you can get for the embalm mechanic now last time i checked out embalm it was on the game day promo and i didn't actually read it ahead of time but we do have the flavor text here and there's some cool things going on with embalm so the card is unwavering initiate Two and a white for a 3-2 Vigilance. It's a human warrior. It's a common. And Embalm, the way this works is if this card is in the graveyard, you can pay the Embalm cost at uh, sorcery speed, and you exile it, and you get a token that's a copy of it, basically. The only difference is that the token is a zombie in addition to its other types. Um, it is a white zombie, too, which is really interesting. It, the only Embalm cards we've seen so far, I believe we've seen two, were both white human creatures. So I don't know if we're going to have Embalm in other colors or not. But from what I read in the Magic article, it seems like Embalm is kind of tied to humans. And it come they come back as uh, zombie humans, and they're white zombies, which is really interesting. Um... Really, really neat mechanic. One of the cool things about this, too, is that there will be a specific um, token 
for each creature within Balm. For instance, there will be a token that says Unwavering Initiate Token, right? Um, and it'll be a 3-2 with Vigilance. It's essentially the same exact card, except uh, it's a zombie, it's a token. It has those few additional tweaks to it, but you're pas basically paying an additional cost to bring the creature back from the graveyard. Um, if you guys remember Shadows over Innistrad, it might have been Eldritch Moon, but I think it was Shadows. Um, there was a card, Ghoul, Ghoul Caller's Apprentice or something like that. It was a 2-2 two -two for 2, and if it was in the graveyard, you could pay 4 mana to exile it and get a 2-2 two -two zombie. That's kind of what you're doing here. You're paying a cost to um, get your guy back. And, uh, sorry, distractions. You're, you're paying a cost to get your guys back. And... Uh, Obviously, the embalm cost is going to be a little bit more expensive than the initial creature, but this um, benefits you in a lot of ways. Uh, this works really nicely with cycling, and I'm, I imagine we will see some sort of card that has embalm and cycling on the same card, which would make sense. It gets it into the graveyard. It lets you trade off pretty early in the game, so um, if you know that you're going to have mana in the late game and you are going to be able to bring back these creature tokens essentially from the graveyard, it um, really incentivizes you to be able to trade off your creatures early, um, have your opponent on minimal resources, and you have these uh, kind of um, cards prepped to come back in the late game. And also it, it supports self-milling a little bit and self-discard a little bit, although so far I've only seen two Embalm cards in white, so I don't know how much self-milling there will be in white, but it's a really neat mechanic. One thing to mention about it before we move on um, and stop talking about it is that when you Embalm something from the graveyard, you're not casting it. You're, um, you're putting an ability on the stack, but you're not actually casting the creature. You're just exiling that, and you're putting an ability on the stack, so your opponent can't use a counter spell that counters a creature in order to stop Embalm. Um, which is a nice little way to get around control magic, and I don't know, this set's looking like it's hating on control magic, you'll see why I say that in a second, but uh, pretty neat mechanic, not really like um, very complicated when you think about it, but it adds a lot to the late game, so we might be in a much slower late game based format than we're uh, used to with uh, Kaladesh and ether revolt uh, moving on we have a re an actual set reprint of avon mind sensor this is one of the masterpieces too from the set so um i wasn't expecting to be in the set as well we already know like they're going to be avon floating around here so we're going to have a lot of bird creatures but avon mind sensor is back in this actual set it's a rare this time i believe it was an uncommon last time it was printed and it's only ever been printed one other time um i want to say in future site um I might be wrong about that. Double check me if I'm wrong. But a couple cool things about this. like it, It's a solid creature. This isn't like a bomb rare by any chance. This isn't the type of card that you're day two of a GP and you want to open. Also, we haven't really seen um, anything that incentivizes you to want the last ability on Avon Mind Sensor. Um, in standard, I'm not really... Uh, I don't really understand why this card's here right now until we start seeing things that really let you search through your deck. There are cards like Traverse the Wolvenwald and, I don't know, Evolving Wilds that you can, like, kind of mess up with Avon Mind Sensor, but I'm not seeing the incentive for having this in standard at the moment, and also there isn't really a lot of reason to, uh, emphasize that ability in limited until we see the entire set and see if it's actually going to be useful or not. Um, for those of you who don't know, I, I didn't even read the card, but basically it stops your opponent from searching their deck. Um, anytime they go to search their deck, they only get to look at the top four cards of their deck instead. This gets played in modern and it shuts down a lot of cool things, but um, you really use it in response to fetch lands and uh, tutor heavy decks, so I don't expect to see this in standard very often. In limited, it's just a fine card, like a two power flash flyer for three mana is okay, but really not anything to write home about. So, decent card. Also mentions the God Pharaoh in the flavor text, but I'm not one to speculate on the story here, so you guys take what you will out of that. Um, Renewed Faith, I believe this is a reprint. Um, I'm not sure from what set, but uh, I believe it's a reprint. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's two and a white for an uncommon instant. You gain six life. And you can cycle it for one in a white. That just means you discard it and draw a new card instead. And when you cycle it, you gain two life. Now, I don't know why this is uncommon. This seems like a weak card to me, and maybe I'm wrong about that. But if I saw a three mana card, even at instant, that said, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, if I saw a two mana card that said draw a card, gain two life, I would not be excited about that. That's just another, like, reviving dose type card or something along those lines and three mana to gain six life still isn't that, that impressive cards that do nothing but gain you life like everybody says it but it's kind of true they're not that great they don't um 
propel the game forward in a meaningful way. Where this does get interesting is if there are payoffs for actually cycling cards. So if we get some sort of enchantment or build around rare and limited that um, cares about you constantly being able to cycle cards and gives you a real reward for that, then I could see renewed faith justifying its uncommon here. But this feels like a common to me. It's got the little kitty cat uh, <laughs> kitty cat god. I forget the name of this one. Um, some of the names we already know. Some of them I'm not sure if we know or not. But they mention them in the flavor text. Um, oh, one other thing to mention about Avon Mind Century. He's got like little bird hands. It's really, I don't know. It's it's awkward. He's got, <laughs> he's like bird and human man. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's really uncomfortable to look at. But anyway, yeah, Renewed Faith. I don't think this is a strong card at all. Um, I'm kind of questioning why it's uncommon, but I don't really know. Uh <laughs> This one's weird. Um, let's click this so we can just look at it. Uh, prowling Serpopards. Purpard. Prowling Serpopard is one and double green for a rare. It's a cat snake, whatever in the holy hell that is. It's a 4-3. So you're paying three mana for a 4-3, which is good and limited, right? Um, it can't be countered, and as long as you control it, your creature spells can't be countered which is interesting but are we really countering creatures in standard right now like i, I don't know um this is a really awkward card because there's not a lot of really potent counter magic in standard um there's some don't get me wrong there's some you, there's your disallow your void shatters scatter to the winds cards like that revolutionary rebuff i don't know things like that but um where there's not a lot of counter magic going around for creatures in standard. And uh, if they print counter magic in this set, well, they just printed a hoser for it, right? This is, uh, what is it, Loxodon Smiter? I bet you that's down here. Oh, it's not. Oh, my God. Uh, Loxodon Smiter from Return to Ravnica, or one, one of those sets... Um, in that block, uh, a 4-4 four, four for 3, that couldn't be countered. And it had some other discard uh, clause here. But th this thing is... I don't know. It's, it's weird. Like, does it have a home in standard right now? In limited, th this is a good card. Uh, I have no doubt. A three mana, four, three that can't be countered and has like a, a ability that's relevant, you know, 2% of the games that you'll actually play it in. That's a fine card. It's it's good. It's a type of card I'd be happy to start a draft off with, single color, so on and so forth. But I don't really know like why this exists in standard right now. It seems weird. Um, Unless I'm just blanket on something right now, but I don't see this solving any problems or bringing anything new to the table for decks that already exist. But uh, I'm here to talk about limited, and it's good. Also, like Cat Snake, really? I, I know people saw that, and what is a Cat Snake? <laughs> what? Uh, I don't know. Um, th this is also one where the flavor text matters. It says the Viziators serving Ronus, the god of strength, maintained the menagerie of animals employed during his trial. So Ronus, I imagine that's the uh, jackal-looking god the one that's on the aggravated assault masterpiece um the god of strength so probably red god and uh he has like this collection of weird animals or something menagerie is just like a collection of animals but um that i don't know it, it we might see some more weird kind of simicky it, it feels simicky right but i don't know it this is like a caladish card that accidentally got dropped off on uh <laughs> ether revolt um i don't know there's enough cats in standard to play a cat tribal deck if you wanted to there really is go promise go look at them there's so many cats in standard uh anyway enough about that card um i think the last thing to talk about here are the lands right and these are pretty sweet i'm gonna go to the main article for this because the they're, they're a little more vibrant but what we have here are five um basic lands or five dual lands non-basic dual lands um they're all rares they're all in almond cat i believe these are the ally colors uh correct me if i'm mismatch an ally and enemy but these are the ally color dual lands you'll notice they actually have the land types which uh we just got some of those in battle for zendikar this i believe would be the fourth um cycle of actual real dual lands um but they come in tapped they tap for one of the two colors and they have cycling for two mana you can just pitch them to draw a new card um, I, I can't emphasize like how good these are. There are already cycle and lands that exist. Uh, most of them are mono colored. I don't know if there are any dual color cycle and lands, but this has a lot of things going for it. Um, in standard, th these are fine. Um, there's not a lot to say about them in standard. They help mitigate flooding, which is kind of where the cycle and ability really comes in handy. Um, Cyclones are just fantastic because if you draw a card with Cyclone and you need mana, you can pitch that card to help dig towards mana. But when you put Cyclone on an actual land, it helps mitigate the flooding problem too. Um, 
drawing too many lands is a problem in any game you play, whether you're in limited or not. And by putting cycling on some of your lands, you're saying, well, if I draw this land when I don't need it, I can pitch it for a new card. And if I draw it when I do need it, well, I have my land, right? So it's an extra little ability tacked onto a land that you probably already play anyway. And um, it gives you a little bit of a, an edge in the late game if you're playing these and your opponent's not, where you can uh, fetch these potentially to your hand, um, and you can discard them to try and improve your draws. It is worth mentioning that there are no fetch lands in standard right now. And one thing I'm curious about is whether or not we'll see a full 10 card cycle with the other five in Amonkhet. And the reason I don't think that's uh, unreasonable is because there are no fetches in standard right now, and it's not like having 10 of these in modern is really going to do anything. Nobody's going to play these over shock lands, or at least no... no um, decks that don't specifically care about having lands in the graveyard or hand are going to care about these. But um, the last time we saw du actual dual lands with the type line um, were the Battle for Zendikar lands, the uh, Tango lands. Or is that true? Yeah, no, they were the the, the Tango lands, the Battle for Zendikar lands. Uh, Cinder Glaive, Canopy Vista, Prairie Stream, those ones. And um, I think the reason we didn't see a full cycle of 10 in that set was because Fetchlands were still in standard from Cons of Tarkir at the time those came out. And uh, if they had done a full cycle of 10, every deck would have had perfect mana. Any Fetchland would have been able to grab any other uh, color from your deck, just like in Modern or Legacy or something like that. And I don't think they wanted that for standard. But with the absence of Fetchlands, I think it's okay to print 10 of these, right? Unless they plan on bringing Fetches back in like the next block after this or uh, shortly thereafter, which who knows, right? Um, so we might see the other five in uh, Hour of Devastation, but for right now we've got these. They are fantastic. In Limited, these are wonderful. Um, even at Rare, I think they're fantastic. I love when a set has Mana Fixin. Um, even at the Rare level, I love when a set has Mana Fixin. And uh, I love when a set has built-in ways to help mitigate the problems of Mana Screw and Mana Flood. And this helps do that. Like, Cycling in general already helps do that. It makes games run a little bit smoother where there are as many games with people who just can't play because of land problems. Um, and having Cycling on your lands is just a great way to make sure games are flowing, make sure interactions are happening, um, things like that. And uh, one last thing to mention about this is that type line um, in formats outside of limited, um, potentially outside of standard too, uh, it, it's, it has some applications being able to fetch uh, a specific card like this to your hand. I'm thinking cards like Tithe, uh, cards that let you go grab um, one of each basic land type or one of each land type and put it into your hand, um, cards like Farseek and stuff, and then you can cycle them. I, I don't know, it's just something to mention, but uh, I don't see this being like the next big thing for um, really any format, but it is just solid, right? I, I think they'll see a lot of play in standard just because they have a lot of utility. Um, there's a lot of flexibility in these type of cards, but outside of that, I don't really see it happening. Um, anyway, that's going to go ahead and take care of everything for today. I believe that's it. Uh, I'm just going to double check make sure there weren't any random spoilers that just came out as I was talking, but with that being said, it's pretty awesome. Um, I think this set is shaping up to be great. I need to see the bulk of it. Uh, we still haven't seen the gods. They're slow rolling us on the mythics, but keep in mind that um, spoiler season hasn't actually really started yet. Uh, I'm recording this on a Friday, and uh, Amonkhet pre-release comes out three weeks from today, so I imagine spoiler season starts on Monday. Might be wrong about that, but uh, let me know what you guys think of the mechanics. Let me know you what you think of the cycling lands here, or <laughs> as my friend called them, the bicycling lands. I'm sure you'll hear that a lot probably before uh, this even hits YouTube. But uh, yeah, let me know what you guys think. And um, I will be back probably on Monday when spoiler season starts to start talking about the meat of the set here. I'm pretty excited to get into it. But anyway, thanks for uh, joining me today to hear me ramble about some lands and cat snakes. Uh, my name is Timothy, and as always, I'll see y'all next time.